Sophia <laughs> with Petula and Vivi from the family Geminis, uh, Castellarisians. Now, the Castellarisians have been migrating to Australia since you know the 1880s, yeah. the chain migration. Um, but you have a very, very different story because your great grandfather, Andonis, actually settles on Samurai Island in Papua New Guinea. That's right, he did. He had a family in Gustalorizo. He had about four or five kids and he was an adventurer. And he, and also economically on Gustalorizo it was pretty bad. So he took his boat, God only knows how he did it, and he ended up past Darwin and he ended up in Samurai Island in New Guinea where he um, was uh, collecting sea urchins, beche de mer, not sea urchins, sea cucumbers, um, sponges and other things and trading with the Chinese and he lived there and then he wanted his wife to come out and join him and uh, like a good classy woman she said no way Jose, uh, she wasn't leaving her family in Nasta Lordisor and so she didn't come. And so he divorced her, which I, I find that really amazing for those years that he was able to get a divorce. You know, like so what, 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 what are we talking about? What year are we talking We're about? Talking, this must have been like the turn of the century. Wow. You know, it may be a little bit earlier. But so he, he stayed there. But what happened was his um, two of his sons decided to join him. Um, Vasily, our grandfather, um, he joined him and, and his brother called George. Um, so they join him on Samurai Island. Yeah, they come over to join their father, adventurers. And also, he had a specific way of fishing. He used to use dynamite. <laughs> and so he blew off his hand. Oh, he blew off his hand? <laughs> yeah. Survived. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, well, well. So the thing is, I, th I think uh, you're telling me that he passed away in 1910. 1910. Yeah. But the, the two brothers stay there on the mm. island. Um, they come back. So the folklore goes. The, well, the, as the, the stories go, Bapu, our Vasili, and George left Samurai Island and they went back to Gustalorizo. What we found out later. No, no, no. The first folklore that we knew was that Andoni had a family in New Guinea, yeah. right? So we he always had another family. So we presume that was the folklore. That's we, what we knew that we had relatives, cousins who were New Guinean. Then yeah, locals. Locals. What we found out later that Bapu actually left Samurai at the beginning of the First World War. Our Bapu, our Bapu Vasili, telling his wife or his his lady friend who was he was established with who had a child and was pregnant that he was going off to join the Australian army to fight in the war well he didn't she he never returned she thought he died and we only found this a few years ago yeah. through internet you know things you find out but Bapu ended up going back to Gustalonizo where they found him a wife as they did matchmaking um, <clears throat> um, Takuni and they married in 1914, and she fell pregnant straight away. Stayed there for about a year, and then he returned back to Australia. So he came to Australia this time? This time he came to Australia. He didn't go back to Samurai, he went to Darwin. Um, and so he stayed, he wrote to my grandmother to come and join him. Now this is while the First World War was going on. So she actually snuck out of Gustalodis or Harbour on a night ship, um, you know, going down to the harbour quietly. With a two-year-old. With a two-year-old and a little bag. And um, I think we still got the bag. No, we don't. Oh, all right. And um, but she ended up coming to Darwin. She had a great voyage coming over. So I had to stay in Port Said, like they often do when they go to Egypt, stay in Port Said, waiting for a boat to take them to Australia. And um, the boat she was on, she was with a few other Cassies, mm -hmm. and they got off at Singapore. And she said they loved it. Singapore was wonderful. It was a big market. And they found some kimonos uh, with embroidery. And they looked a lot like the Castle Illusion scarves that they wear on the traditional clothing that they wear, with the big silk, with the fringes and everything. And they saw these kimonos, so they bought them. And that night, when they got back on the boat, they were in their dining room, because they had a little dining room, on a, it must have been a cargo ship. And the, the waiter that they had just go looking at them, going, no, 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 no. And Ilya and her friends were looking at him, like, why look, you know, like we're, yeah. we're, we're nicely <laughs> dressed. Lucius. <laughs> and he goes, for bedroom, for bedroom. <laughs> and then they realised that they were wearing 
night and time. <laughs> and, she, you know, even till she was like 80, whatever, she would always tell that story and laugh because it was so, she, it was so hilarious. funny to her. Hilarious. She, hilarious. So she came to Darwin and met up with Bapu. Um, two, we have two stories. One, he was working on the wharves. I don't know if he was or whether he was working in the Vesti meat abattoirs. The abattoirs. Know, because a lot of Greeks were working there at the time. And they only ran for a few years anyway because I think it went broke. But um, they stayed up there and then within a couple of years of being in Darwin where she lost a, a baby girl, she had a baby girl up there. How did, how did she have a child? The floor was, was dirt. Sand. The, <clears throat> it was a tin shed. It was hot. Um, she couldn't speak English. Uh, her, she never dwelt on it but that was her life but she must have been so tough especially she came from Gasolodis or our house with Lucio it was mm. three story it was full of things nice things mm. anyway so they ended up in Sydney now, and the thing is um, <coughs> this is where the Marrickville story starts mm, well nearly because nearly. They, they get to Sydney and they live in Woolloomooloo for a while um, they open up a fish shop in Surrey Hills for a few years moved around for a couple of shops and then in 1930, Yad decides they needed a shop where they could be settled. Um, and they bought the business in Marrickville, in Marrickville Road. The whereabouts in Marrickville? Yeah, it's, it's down towards the Victoria Street um, intersection. intersection, sort of up the road. I think there was an old picture theatre opposite, mm -hmm. a bit further up. So they're in that end of Marrickville. So, and this, this predates like the, the, the Greek migration en masse to Maryville by 30 years, you know? Yeah. So so in many ways, you know, the family is um, like a pioneering family in Maryville, yeah, yeah. as we know Maryville, the Greek suburb, yeah. Little Greece now. Um, yes, it they, wasn't Little Greece then. <laughs> it definitely wasn't. No, and what, we're talking 1931. No, it was 1930 they moved there, yeah. Yes. And, um, you know, you talked about, you know, you know having two rooms. Yeah, the, the back of the shop was two rooms. Two rooms. Two rooms, a little tiny kitchen area, I think the, the bathroom toilet was outside. Um, one was a bedroom and she had set it up with a double bed and a single bed for her four boys. Four boys? Four boys. Um, and she had a bed in the saloni with a, a tables and chairs. And and sometimes people would come down and stay with her. Yeah. She Because um, Bapu had a brother up in... Yeah, Manu. Yeah, Port Macquarie. I think he was in Port Macquarie. Yeah, Macquarie. 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 And the three, the husband, wife, and the son, and the daughter, would all come down and stay. Where they slept, I have and no idea. Their cousin Cedric would come, and they would say, "All oh, right, the cousin has come." They'd turn him upside down and shake all the change out of his pockets <laughs> because he was getting pocket money, <laughs> and they weren't. But your, your parents <laughs> buy the the fish shop in 1930. Tough years because we got the depression. Yeah, but my grandparents went through a lot. It was poor. Um, the dad's older brother, Tony, he's about 10, 12 years older than dad, his stories of those times are uh, it's full of poverty and hardness, and he was upset at the way his mother had to work so hard because my grandfather wasn't a hard worker. Um, and they would eat. Most meals were whatever was left over at the shop. Um, you'd eat cold, cold fried fish with Worcestershire sauce. Delicious tomato sandwiches for lunch for school. And Which he, one of your uncles yeah. disliked? Oh, he disliked it, and for him, that just brought up that whole memory of how poor they were. Whereas my father, who was the youngest, and maybe because he has a different way of looking at life. Loved cold fish. <laughs> Give him a bottle of Worcestershire sauce, he was happy as Larry. A tomato, a loaf of bread and some butter, he was done. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. But um, his memory, he didn't see that poverty as much as the older yeah, brothers children did. Children don't. No, no. no. Yeah. But Yaya said it was tough. She didn't, she said, I, I couldn't understand how the other families bought toys for their kids at Christmas. And it was a few years later she discovered that people had lay -bys. She didn't know what this lay by was. Oh, and then she worked it out that she could lay by. But she used to put the franca aside, didn't she? She used to say, she was, she, although it was tough in those years, she said, and in 1939, she was shown a block of units, a small block of units Kensington. at Kensington to buy by a, a nephew. She had to go and tell the nephew to show it to her husband first so that he thought it was his idea. 
and they ended up buying. Very, it. very, uh, my big fat Greek here, you yeah, know, the, yeah, the, the, the neck. Yeah, was the neck. She was the neck. She, <laughs> she, <laughs> she organised everything. So in 19, so they were, so they bought that block of units as an investment. It wasn't to live in, but as an investment. And they're still living in the two rooms behind the shop at, at Marrickville. By the time the Second World War comes around, three of her sons get called up. Um, the eldest one gets pulled out of university. Um, he was studying medicine. He got pulled, he got, he went into the RAF and he was doing, um, it wasn't up in a plane, he was... Um, uh, ground staff. Ground staff, coordinating um, distances or whatever, and blah, 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 that sort of stuff. Um, and the other two were actually based in Sydney. One was in the Quartermasters, and I don't know what the other one was doing. And, and for Dad, <laughs> being the youngest, you've got this story where she travels all the way to Melbourne. Because yeah. he gets drafted as well. So he gets, she gets a letter for him. Now, at this stage, my grandfather is quite ill. And so it's Yaya, um, Baniyota, and Dad in the shop by themselves. And he's the one who's going to the markets, and, you know, he, picking up the bags of potatoes and, you know, doing all the heavy stuff. And so she thinks, well, I can't run a shop by myself. And food shops were important during the war. So um, you had to make an ex call for an exemption. She had to go to Melbourne on a train by herself. Limited Greek. <laughs> Limited English. <laughs> Forget the Greek. <laughs> she could speak Greek. <laughs> Limited English. And she went down there and pleaded her case. And he was able to stay home. Although Dad later on regretted that, that he didn't go to the army. He didn't go into Because the he was a big romantic. Anything with guns. Yeah, yeah. He liked guns. But every year when he was driving cabs for the RSL, he would volunteer to, um, on Anzac Day, he would have old veterans. They used to have cabs taking the old veterans in the march and he would drive his, um, his cab to do that. It's sort of like his way of participating in some way in Anzac Day. What stories do we have of Papu in Marigold? Do we have any stories of...? Uh, uh, well, not of Papu, just that he, he would shop for the, for the shop and... Papu, yeah, Papu would go down to the markets to do the shopping, but it was Dad that was taking the, an early truck, um, picking all the hard work there. I mean, Dad, when he was growing up at Marrickville, yeah, Yaya wouldn't let him go out to play or even go to school until he had peeled the potatoes that they needed for that day. They peeled them, made them into scallops or into and chips, and then he was allowed out. And he had a friend next door, another Greek family, and that boy, George also, he would be knocking on the door going, come on, come on, let's play cricket all, you know, we've got to go to school. And he goes, we've got to finish these potatoes. And so George would come in and they'd be both sitting there peeling potatoes so and making George, cheese. And George that's George Kazaglas. George Kazaglas with George Gemma. <laughs> Gemma. And um, the Kazaglas family had the fruit <laughs> shop. Yes. Yeah, feudal. Next door. So yeah. there's there's a bit of a Greek connection in yeah. Marrickville. Yeah, yeah, there were some Greek families there, um, but there weren't, there weren't the amount that there was. Hmm. Yeah, so... Sorry, I could hear something. <laughs> and um, the, Papu dies. Papu dies in 1946. Yeah. But uh, Yaya still, keep, still keeps the shop with Dad. Yeah, she does. He, um, they bought a house at Kingsford in 1946, um, a big place on Avoca Street. And then, so that, but Papu was ill and he died within a few months of them buying the, the house. And so Dad was working in the shop. Yaya didn't work in the shop. And I think Dad had staff there. Um, and then when he got married in 1950 to my mother, Angie, Angie Katalis, slave labour, mother Kazi, um, slave labour, she was working in the fish shop with him. Um, and they had the shop then probably till 1954 and 55, you know, that, that sort of stuff. And, and there's a great story, there's a great story of the proxy, proxy amounts. Oh, oh yeah. When they, when dad, dad and mum's was a love match. It wasn't a proxy amount. He used to pick her up from the bus stop. Unno unbeknownst to her mother. Yeah. And on a Saturday. Uh, on she a had Saturday. to go and visit her grandmother. Yeah. And she waited the tram stop, waiting oh, to the tram stop. Um, to go to Piemont. And he drove past her one day and he stopped and he said, Come on, I'll give you a lift. She goes, I want to make the car with you, I've your reputation. And she, he says, You know who I am? He goes, She said, Yeah, that's it, right, I know who you are. Anyway, she liked bad boys, I think. So she did end up getting in the car with him and this went on for a few weeks. He pick her up. And he'd drop her off at the grandmother's. He'd wait half an hour because he knew she'd be out the door within half an hour. Pick her up and take her back home. And but she did say they had a bit of a kiss. Oh, yeah. She said he was like an octopus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and 
difficult. The fish food, yeah. uh, fish, fish <laughs> <Yes>. shop connection. <laughs> and, then, um, and then he said to her one day, he said, if I send someone around to ask for your hand in marriage, what would you say? And she said, do it and find out. <laughs> she wouldn't give him a straight answer. So they got married. Well, the two old ducks then got into the negotiations for the, the boxing yeah, the, the dowry. For the dowry. And um, Nana had married three daughters off and the last daughter got 500 pounds as a, as a, as a dowry. dowry. And um, so she went to the na table to negotiate 500 pounds. She paid for that one, why should she pay more? Yeah, Yabba no Yoto wanted 600 pounds. No, no, the opposite. No, yeah, Yabba no Yoto wanted 600 pounds. Nana only wanted to pay 500 pounds. All oh, right. That's right. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. I'm not the one that's good with money. I know. <laughs> and, um, and so they negotiated, but yeah, yeah, was adamant. You want my son? It's 600 pounds. So dad was a bit upset that that had happened. And mum was upset. So once they got married, he took mum and he went and bought her a very good upright, new upright piano with the, with the money that he got as a dowry. So that was really nice. And that was the why it was important to keep the piano. And so I have the piano now. You still have the piano? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, she got the piano. She's the one who can play piano. Yeah. <laughs> she should keep the piano. Why do you think they left Marrickville? Because <clears throat> Dad becomes, I think, uh, a TV salesman. And yeah, initially he's, he's selling TVs because TVs had just come out in Australia. So yeah, he had, had to put money in them. Some of them, yeah, he had to put money well, in. For the ones we had, you had to put money in. They were the rental ones. Ah, oh, they were the rental yeah, ones. Yeah, but he, he was selling TVs to the Greek community, the Cassie community. He then got a cab. He was driving a cab. Was he, was he over, was he over he was the shops? he was over the shop. It was hard work. It was wet work. But he did end up going back into the fish industry. The f once fish is in your blood, it doesn't leave you. So he worked. He ended up working for his brother at Campsy. He worked for the Sydney Fish Market Authority. Um, he worked for Woolworths, setting up their fish shops in their um, supermarkets. And he was happy as Larry, sitting on the shore, plucking oysters off rocks and going fishing. One of his best friends was Peter Doyle. He loved him. He loved him. And they would uh, go on adventures together yeah. around Australia. We went to Tasmania together. Look at all. We, before salmon became big, they went down to see the, the early starting of the, the salmon farms. Tassels. He had a great time with Peter. So, as as you know, Cassie girls, yeah. right, growing up in the fifties, oh, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. uh, what was it like growing up and going, let's say, to it must have been Maroubra, it must have been the eastern suburbs. Yeah, we lived at Kingsford, but we our closest school was Maroubra Junction mm -hmm. Primary and High School. Um, it was it was okay. We were talking about it before about did we get targeted? I, I got targeted a bit about being a wog or a dago. No, um, I never heard the word dago. No, we heard the word wog was more yeah, common. The, the mum, when she was young, she got dago a lot. And so did Dad. Dad so tried to get a job when he was 15, because um, there were a number of factories around um, around Marrickville, and he would, they wouldn't hire him because he was a dago. And he found it really distressing because he saw himself as Australian. He was born in Australia. Mm. So was Mum, you know. But they were still targeted. My father spoke strine and broken Greek. Yeah. <laughs> you never know that he was Greek from his Greek. Yeah. He was so poor. <laughs> and did you go did you go to Greek school, yeah. afternoon school? Oh uh, yeah, we did the afternoon school stuff. Where, where was that at the time? Um, we went to one at Meek Street in Kingsford and then we went to another one in Roby Street at Mimura. And was that expected? Yeah, everybody did it. All of our age group, all of the Greek kids did Greek school. We hated it. We hated it. And what about what about the other Greek kids at the day school? Like when you went to Maroubra Junction, oh. were there lots of Greek kids at the no. time? No, there was a few, a, few, a handful. I, I'm still friends with some. Yeah, <laughs> I actually just found a photograph of me in, in the netball team when in primary school in sixth class, and there's what seven or eight of us, and three of them are Greeks. <laughs> One's a cousin and one's a good friend. So, you know, like a friend. So, yeah, there were a few, but there weren't a lot. Well, you, you talk about Dad, you know, having broken Greek. In the in the home, what did you guys speak? English. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, would speak Greek, and she died in 1979, so she'd speak Greek. We'd often answer her in English and a bit of broken Greek. Yeah, but she called the kettle 
Topili, Valle Topili. No, Pelicani. To Pelicani, right? Mm. So I thought that was Castle Region. And, and so, you know, all my life I thought it was Castle Region until about, what, 20 years ago we found out that it was Billy Cam. <laughs> and she had put the E at the end. Billy Cam. <laughs> So our Greek was really Australianized. Yeah. So when we go to Greece, they look at us like we're nuts. Yeah. <laughs> and um, what um, what was your relationship? Let's say, church. I mean, the the Cassie Church with inverted commas in Sydney was, of course, Hagia Sophia. Yeah. Is that where you went? Yeah. As, yeah. as kids, we went with Yaya to church on a Sunday. Um, she until she couldn't walk up those stairs. Yeah. She would go every week. That was our church. Um, my mother lived across the road from that church yeah. as a young girl. Yeah, so for her that was that was our church. And it was only when there was all that um, fuss with the community, the Greek community, and Father Glavivi got kicked out of the church, and my mother was heartbroken. She was one of the demonstrators at the time, demonstrating. She took us. Yeah, she took us to um, to <laughs> demonstrate. With placards. Yeah, placards. She was out there. Yeah, she loved it. And she made the, the, the news. news. <laughs> She was really out of it, oh. but um, she ended up because to her then the church wasn't hers anymore because yeah. the community had it. Um, we ended up going to Evangelist Moor in Redfern um, on Cleveland Street. So I got married from there. My kids all got baptised there, and the funerals were all held and, and, and did you did your family have strong connections? Let's say with the with the Castellarusian Association. Oh yeah, Mum was a president for a while on the ladies' committee, um, and they were. Often with all the events and things that they had, she was um, mum was very uh, community minded, so she belonged like to the Kazi lady. She was president. She was on the Greek young matrons. She belonged to a HEPA. Um, if anyone needed a piano player, because she could play piano really, really well, very well. Um, they would ask, Angie, can you come and play piano at our Christmas concert? Mm. And she, mum would just look at what songs they were and just play. Um, it was it was a really we actually made friends with people at Belmore Church when they were first starting Belmore Church. They would have their Christmas um, show, all, you know, all the kids doing all their songs, and Mum would go up there to play piano for them, and she'd take us along with her. We made friends with all these people. Lifelong friends. friends. Lifelong friends. So. Yeah. You, you talked about, you know, going back to Castel Orozo and people thinking you're, you're, you're crazy, but not crazy. But how do you feel when you go back to Castellorizzo? Like your family, like your great grandfather has been away from Castellorizzo since the 1890s. Yeah. We're talking about, you know, 2023. If you were to go back to Castellorizzo, how do you feel? Connected. Yeah, I, I get teary when I arrive. Um, the last few times it's been by boat, which is really good, so that you're coming into the harbour. Um, I walk around, I know where my grandmother's house was. We, we actually had sold that. Um, which was good for someone else's, you know, fixing it up. It would have cost too much to have it fixed up. And I just sort of feel like I can feel my forebearers walking through those little la lanes and around the corners, and you know, as though you can hear them, but mm. not quite. I, where, where I feel disconnected is on the mainland of Greece, mm. because they speak Greek very fast, <laughs> and they have a different. Um, mm. And so I remember the first time I went to Greece and I was on the mainland and I could barely make out what they were saying. And we got to Rhodes and we sat down in a restaurant and all of a sudden I turned around and I thought, I can hear all my aunties talking mm. because of the sing-songness of our speech. Mm. And and that made me really... I, I thought there was... Betty Theodore was sitting behind me. It was that, that sing-song that, you know... Like, and I thought, oh, yeah, I'm home. I, I'm... This is the, the voice I can use, our voice, not on the Peloponnese. Because my husband's from the Peloponnese, so we spend a lot of time there too. And, and so, so, so what does Casadorism mean to you? It's a homeland, isn't it? Oh, yeah. It is, it is, definitely. But it's, it's not the physical part of it. I mean, we really don't have that connection. And we had the choice of keeping the house and fixing it up, but there's no way we would go and spend three or four months a year I don't, couldn't do that commitment. Um, but it's just, it is, you know that that's where you're from. I um, I lived in Greece. For, you lived in Greece? For three years, I went over and uh, in the 70s. And um, it, it was something else, it was very different. 
early 70s or late 70s? Uh, 76 to 79, yeah. So that's after the dictatorship, so Greece was very, very different. Very different. Um, I did go to Gastelodizel then, um, but uh, yeah, it was, it was it's quite an experience. And it brought uh, that connection of being Greek to the fore, yeah. We grew up with mum saying to us, you're Greek, you're Greek. Mm. Ma, uh, can't speak it. Uh, and then, okay, you're Greek Australian. And we go, oh, okay, mm -hmm. all right. And then people would ask you, oh, where are you from? And you know, you'd say, oh, I'm Greek. And then it took us a while to work out that, no, we're actually Australian and our heritage is Greek. Yeah. So when I was working in the public service and you go to places like Haringai, where they're all white, um, and they'd say to me, oh, so where are you from? Mm -hmm. And I'd go, Kingsford. <laughs> it's like, why are you trying to tag me with, with my ethnicity? My ethnicity? Um, but that took us a while to work out who we were, didn't it? It did, it did. But I think as a country, it kind of evolved into, rather than asking someone, where are you from, you know, oh, what's your heritage? You know, that's, that's kind of the more standard question these days. Yeah, it is, because, you know, sometimes people get a bit thingy about it. Do they? So, you know, like, yeah, you do have to, we are, we are Australian, but our heritage is Greek. Yeah, yeah. And when I went to Greece for the first time, I wasn't Greek, no. I was a skippy. Yeah. They, I was a Xenia. Although they, they'd look at me, they think I was Greek. They'd look at my husband, think he's German, and I'd have to say to them, no, he's the Greek. I'm, you know, it's him, not me. The Greeks would hear my accent and they'd go, get out, you say. I worked out when I went to Greece, I didn't speak Greek. I just spoke in English because tourists got treated better than Greeks. Greeks who had left, they presumed that I had gone as a child. So I'd get people going off at me about my lousy Greek. And I go, but I was born in Australia. Oh, your parents should be ashamed of themselves not bringing you up speaking Greek. And I go, my parents were born in Australia. And then they go, oh, oh they're lucky you this way. <laughs> <laughs> they just assumed. Anyway. Ladies, thank you very much. Oh, thank, thank you. you. It's been very enjoyable. Yeah.